Good morning and welcome to a conversation with indeed one of the greatest legends of psychological science, although a woman came up to Dr. Milner earlier and said, oh, it is such an honor to meet you. You're a legend in our field. And she said, well, sometimes legends are disappointing. <laughs> I want you to know in my conversations with her over the last couple of days, she is not disappointing. Brenda Milner is, in fact, one of our greatest psychological scientists, and she has been practicing this for more than 60 years. She is 93 years old and received her undergraduate degree in 1939 at the University of Cambridge, just around the time of what the English call that little problem with the Germans was about to begin. She's been doing important research on the brain long before today's sophisticated technology. She got her PhD with Donald Hebb at McGill University in 1952 and had joined Wilder Penfield at the Montreal Neurological Institute in 1950, where she eventually became professor of psychology with joint appointments in the psychology department at McGill as well. Her life work has greatly expanded our understanding of the brain in particularly important areas of memory and language. Her most famous work, of course, known to generations of students and researchers, was with the man known to us all as H.M., who had had most of his temporal lobe removed in order to control his very severe epilepsy. Although the surgery was successful in controlling his seizures, it left him with anterior grade amnesia, and it was Dr. Milner's experiments with him that began a deep understanding of the parts of the brain involved in memory functioning. Dr. Milner has, of course, been honored many times for her contributions to psychological science. APS, of course, gave her its William James Award. Recently, she received the Perlmeister Greengard Prize for her work in cognitive neurosciences, plural, and human memory, and the National Academy of Sciences Award in the Neurosciences. But perhaps we should all join in a little rendering of O Canada, because one of my favorite notes about her is that she has received Quebec's highest civilian honor, a grand officer of the National Order of Quebec, and the Canadian government has made her a companion of the order of Canada. Canada is a country that truly honors its scientists, including its psychological scientists. So Dr. Milner, we salute you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, of course, am always interested in beginnings. And you, at 93, have had very interesting history of nearly a century of extraordinary change in this field. So will you begin by telling us something of your family, your parents, how you became interested in science, such an unusual interest for young women in your generation? Well, I have no science in my background. My parents were both uh, musicians. My father was musical critic on the Manchester Guardian, which is now the Guardian newspaper, as you probably know it. Um, he was a pianist. My mother went to him for, for singing lessons. and. She was 23 years younger than he was, so he died. And so my first years were uh, sort of homeschooled, if you like, because he was at home in the mornings having written his critique of the opera, whatever, the night before. And uh, so I, I learned a little German early, which was, you know, Manchester was a big musical city then. He said all his best friends were interned at that point. It's interesting you said the little trouble with the Germans later. We had little trouble with the Germans there, then too when I was born. <laughs> and that I, I really should go back to my first year of life because some people are interested in this and I, looking back, am quite interested in it. My mother and I both contracted the famous Spanish flu. In I was born in 1918. That was when there was this huge epidemic and it affected uh, it didn't affect so much the old people, and my father didn't catch it, but my mother had it, she was 34, I was six months old and I had it, and we both survived, and I think, and, and into our 90s, my mother lived to be 95, so I think that uh, I must have been very, I'm very grateful to her for my genes, and <laughs> that's my immune system to date, <laughs> who knows. Uh, so I 
did an awful lot, a lot of, of Shakespeare, a little German, a little French, uh, at the, uh, those first seven or eight years. And then my father died. And I went to Withington Girls School, which is a very, very good school to this day. It's really thriving. And, uh, that, and it was an all girls school. And that's where I stayed. And this is where I developed this great love for mathematics and physics. And I didn't do any biology. It was physics and mathematics. And also, of course, uh, Latin. But then my Latin teacher left. People had to leave when they got married then. And so all the, all the most attractive teachers were getting married <laughs> and leaving. And so so <laughs> that, that was quite a frustration. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I had a little battle with my headmistress because I was, my heart was set. I had to get scholarships anyway. You see, we had no money, and I had to get scholarships. And it was a very competitive world. And, and I set my heart on Cambridge. Uh, all sorts of reasons, the, the Civil War in the past, all sorts of historic reasons why I preferred Cambridge to Oxford. And of course, Oxford in those days was the place you went to in the arts, in languages and literature and humanities, and Cambridge was the place you went to in the science. Nowadays, it's much more mixed. There's a little bit of that. And so I wanted to do maths, and I wanted to go to Cambridge. And my school wanted me to go to Oxford and do languages, and they said, it would be much easier for you. You've got a talent for languages, and you're going to find it hard. And I said, I want to go to Cambridge. And I managed, goodness knows how, I, I managed to get a Manchester City Scholarship and went to Cambridge in mathematics, but uh, Newnham College. But, um, and there are only 400 women allowed in Cambridge across the three years and all subjects at that time. So I was competing with, with girls, right? <laughs> and so uh, and then I found myself in Cambridge, and I discovered, I'm, re I'm a realist, I, we, fortunately they sent us to the maths class for the next year to give us an idea of what the second year maths would be like. And I realized that maths was not just pure reasoning. So I considered myself, probably still do, a very logical and reasoning individual, human being. But there's more to it. You have to be perceptually skilled in, in, in mathematics, in higher algebra. When you look at something in front of you and you have to think about it, you have to be able to organize it visually. And I'm really not very good perceptually, and it really hit me. And I thought, this is not. I, this, I'd better get out of this field while the going is good. So at the end of the first year, I passed my exams, but uh, at the end of the first year, no glory about it, I decided I have to get out of maths. And then I thought, well, I still want to do this logical thing. So I, why not philosophy? And then the older students at my college came to me, and they said, Brenda, don't you have to earn your living? Of course I have to earn my living. Nobody earns their living in philosophy. <laughs> so, 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 but then, and this was interesting, in those days, and this was in the 30s, the psychology, experimental psychology, the Cambridge Department of Experimental Psychology, and my degree there is in experimental. Uh, but psychology and um, philosophy and ethics, I think, they group, were grouped together as moral sciences. Now psychology is in the natural sciences, but in those days it was in the moral sciences. And so the, the people trying to advise me, they said, well, you know, you can't earn a living in philosophy, but why not try psychology? You could be a factory inspector or something. And so, uh, so I, I didn't know anything about psychology. And Professor Bartlett, the, the famous Bartlett, who did work on memory, as you probably all know, um, he was the head of the department, and his wife was also a very good psychologist, and she was the director of studies in my college. And she said to me, well, I suppose you read this over the summer holidays. And they gave me a great big encyclopedia of experimental psychology. It was really like that. Murchison, probably an early Murchison book. And I took it home to Manchester on the train, and I studied it <laughs> diligently over the summer. And then I came back, and that was really amazing. I, you know, I, I suddenly found that I was in a field. I had no idea that I would turn out to be, be I turned out to be a good observer. That, and this is an interesting thing, you know. Um, I believe that the things that come easily to you, you assume come easily to everybody, and you don't particularly value them. The things that you really have to work at and struggle at, like, like I did with my mathematics, you think, oh, you know, that is really something worth doing. 
Um, and so I, I thought, I was very good at noticing odd quirks of behavior in people or in animals, or, and then I would want to know how to measure it, how to investigate it, and that's exactly what an experimental psychologist is trained to do. And what, what medical people are not, you really notice that difference with neurology. They know a lot of things that we don't know, but they don't really know how to test their patients. It's very strange. Well, I'm exaggerating. They're learning. <laughs> but, uh, so, but this, came, to me, came naturally. And so I just thought everybody was a good observer. It's so obvious, you know, but it's not true. Anyway, it suited me. I was very happy in, in doing psychology, and it went very well, and I, I did very well. <laughs> and, uh, and so when I graduated, I got a scholarship from my college to do another two years as a graduate student, you'd call it here. And, but then, 1939, uh, the war broke out. I think I've exhausted your question. You've seen how I got there. Except to tell you one other thing which is important, which is that I didn't lose my fidelity to the French language. I have a way of thinking, well, I'm going to show them. They thought that by uh, giving up uh, the, the humanities and uh, going off into science, you know, that that was it. Uh, but. I think you can continue. That was another reason for staying in science. Once you give up science, you can't do it on your own. But you, you can keep up your French. And I had kept up my French, and this is important for my future, but I did it for pleasure. I kept up the French all through doing mathematics and doing psychology. I, I read books for pleasure, only you know French novels, French literature, not science, but I read French. I wasn't talking it, and I never went to Paris. I never money. During the war, nobody went to Paris. But I was studying it in French, and that's important also. But so look, as you're studying experimental psychology and mathematics and so forth, this was not considered unusual for a woman. You got support from a teacher's faculty for doing yes, this. Because yes. you seem to be just following your heart and interests into it, this field. Well, it was no very... No boulders in the way? <laughs> well, it, the, the only boulders were the competitiveness. This business that I said, there were only 400. And Oxford was very similar. There were two women's colleges at Cambridge, and Unum and Girton. And uh, 400 students allowed in the university across the three years that it takes to get a degree and all the subjects. So it was very, very competitive. As I say, I, to get in in mathematics, I had to be competitive. It was with other girls, right? I mean, but, uh, and whereas there were loads and loads of thousands of men. Now this is very, very different because, well, there are a few more women's colleges, but the main difference is that, that women in both Oxford and Cambridge now go to the men's colleges. There's no, no barrier whatsoever. It's just merit or unfortunate, many things, but it's not a, a, a gender barrier. But in, in those days, it was just limited how many would be in that city, and I was determined. <laughs> you were determined. I was, I've always been determined. Yes. <laughs> Somehow I have that feeling about you. I can't think why. <laughs> So let's consider now this decade then between, so the, you, you graduate um, uh, and then you, it was a, the war a decade, then, come, then comes the war, and then comes somehow your move to Canada and Quebec. So would you like to fill us in yes, about well, that decade? Two, two How stages. you found yourself studying? Well, well uh, Bartlett, who was the, uh, the chair at Cambridge, I said, was very influential with the government. He was very highly respected in England. Um, but, and he was very good at keeping his scientists out of uniform, we were we were recruited as, as civil servants, if you like. But we, but we, were, but my first two years, I had my Cambridge scholarship, so it was no problem. But, but it's important to know that we were doing war work, but we were not in uniform. And this meant that you could, we were working with the Air Force, and you could look an air marshal in the eye and tell him something, and he had to listen. But if you were in uniform and junior rank, it would be very different. So Bartlett was very, very good that way. So I, so we, and I worked for, adapted some of my tasks to deciding whether pilots should be in fighter planes or bomber planes. This was the sort of thing we were doing. But my money ran out of the two years. And then I was recruited by C.P. Snow, the novelist and scientist. He's a scientist, too. Um, he came to Cambridge recruiting people. And he recruited me for um, uh, the radar research establishment, in, which began in the south coast of England, but then moved 
they moved to the center of England, Malvern, because they were afraid uh, that the Germans would come and capture brains, not our young little brains, but the, we had some really very fine scientists, uh, mature scientists, and uh, they didn't want to have Germans coming over and capturing them and taking them back to Germany to work for them or whatever. So we were moved to the middle of England, and it was, it was lovely, actually. <laughs> and, uh, so, and this, my job, I, and here there were very few, very few women, right, officers. I was, um, uh, there, were th there were two women librarians and there was me. There were the three officers, if you like, in this big establishment of physicists and, and uh, mathematicians. I was getting back with physics and mathematics. And uh, the job there was ra radar research. This was the Battle of Britain, which was really critical. Radar was very critical in the Battle of Britain. And there were uh, planes coming over. We wanted to know how to represent the plane. Uh, and how to follow it to keep it on target so it could be shot down. And so uh, one had to find the best way of displaying the plane and the best way of keeping on track. You could do, try to do that with what they call direct laying and then you're really working very, very hard. Or you can do it with velocity laying and then just a small movement it can produce a big effect, or something in between the two that we called aided laying, and my, and which was the best. But my job was to try to find out which was the best kind of control and which was the best way of displaying the plane. And of course, to do that in, in a lab in the center of England, I was not looking at real planes, uh, we had to have a, a markup of an apparatus for doing this. And Peter Milner, my maiden name was Langford, it's not Milner. Peter Milner um, was an electrical engineer who was working at, uh, there and had the job of designing the apparatus that I was using. And that, that is how I got to know Peter. And often this apparatus would break down and I would call Peter. And so we really got, and he got interested in psychology. And you know, that's how we became friends. Brenda, excuse me, but my job is now to get you to Canada with Peter. Okay, <laughs> that's the next thing. Yes, so, so uh, <laughs> all, we knew by the end of 44 that the war in, in Europe was coming to an end. And we all, I was going to go back to Cambridge, it's all settled. And then one evening, Peter comes in and he's looking very worried and puzzled. <laughs> and he'd been called in that day um, to a meeting with the director uh, because Sir John Cockroft, who is a very famous physicist who was based in Cambridge actually, had been invited to take a group of physicists and engineers and mathematicians uh, to Canada to set up the beginnings of Canadian atomic energy. And Peter, who was very good at what he did, was uh, invited to go along. And invited in wartime means told, right? And so and they were leaving next week or something like that. So <laughs> on the spur of the moment, we got married. And uh, we, we literally did. We went out and <laughs> went back to work half an hour later. And, and then we packed up all, all our books. They went through uh, and, you know, uh, um, Birmingham for censorship. And, and then we sailed from Scotland, from Glasgow, and the Queen Elizabeth, which was a troop ship. And, uh, with all, and there was full of, of war brides, people who had married. I was asked the other day, what is a war bride? And I thought, what a war bride is? Uh, war brides were English girls who had married American soldiers and sailors and were being taken back to the United States uh, to, be, to the families of the men that they had married. And so this, uh, this ship was full of, of war brides. And it was also full of, of troops and things. And, and us and we zigzagged across the Atlantic in a really perfect blackout uh, to, the, uh, to land in Boston. And on the way, the thing that I remember of that, because I was traveling with Peter, right? With, uh, um, they called all the women the first night into this big salon, and the ship's captain uh, told us that we mustn't harass the men. <laughs> and so, they, so anyway, that's how I got. So, then I, so there I'm in Boston. We still didn't know what was happening next. But then what was in fact happening was that we were on a train up to Montreal, Canada. And so there I am in Montreal. I thought for one, we both thought for one year, right? I still, we're both still there. <laughs> but, uh, so I got into Montreal and that was the first amazingly lucky thing. And one of the things that I always say to everybody in any lecture is that you don't get anywhere without luck. I don't lose anybody who's had a successful career can just look back and say, oh, it's all my splendid effort. Uh, it's 
you have to have luck along the way, and you have to recognize that luck and seize it, right? And, but my luck was to find myself in a French-speaking city. Well, it was much more English-speaking now then than it is now, but French, and I had never, remember, I had this love of French. And I had to look around for a job. And the McGill department was really depleted at that point because most of the staff had gone off to do things in the war effort and was still so engaged. And anyway, I didn't have uh, this wonderful PhD and so on. They didn't bother about those things in England in those days. So I was looking for a job, and the first job I got was from the French University, the Université de Montréal, which was very exotic for me because it was run by Dominican priests, and they were all in white robes, and I'd never seen a Dominican priest in my life, I don't think. The head of the department was a, a Father Mayu, who was a Dominican priest who was teaching Freud in the daytime and, uh, and St. Thomas Aquinas in the evenings to his students. And I, I, of course, that left a lot of psychology out, right? So he was delighted to have the chance, and so he asked me if I would teach um, Bartlett's theory of memory, and then if I would, uh, if I would run an experimental psychology class, and then if I would run a comparative psychology, rats, and so on. And I, that was a real challenge. I mean, I, I was so excited to be working in a French environment, and I needed the job. But you realize I didn't have the vocabulary. Uh, for, it's very different vocabulary from, from Flaubert and Racine and so on. <laughs> Nor did I have the habit of speaking French. I had the habit of reading and understanding it. Nor did I have an ear for Quebecois French, which is it, it's, it, it's actually much better French than, than, than I realized when I got there. But the accent, it's a question. The, there is a, a vocabulary, a local vocabulary too, but there is an accent which is really very different from the accent I had been trained on. So I had these three things, the accent, the vocabulary, and the fact that I was speaking a language which I'd really never used for work before. So I worked terribly hard on it, but it was, it was wonderful. And I spent seven years at the University of Montreal, and I, I, I really... Uh, and I really loved it, you know, and, and I still have many friends there. So, so then how did you get to work with Dr. Hebb and Dr. Penn? Well, you see, as I say, psychology at McGill was nothing at that point. Uh, but they knew they had to build that department up. And they began by getting McLeod. You may have heard of McLeod from Europe, who had worked on the Constances in Europe. And... Uh, uh, he came and he was rebuilt the department. He got Ferguson in statistics, and, and he got Donald Hebb. And Donald Hebb had, was a Canadian who had, um, uh, was a student of, Carl, of Lashley. And uh, he, Hebb had spent one year in 1937 uh, at the Montreal Neurological Institute, where Penfield, that, which was founded in 34, 1934, and where Penfield was pioneering the neurosurgical treatment of epilepsy. And Hebb had been able to study some of Penfield's patients in that period and been impressed by, well, he thought the relevance of this because what was, Hebb was doing was insisting, as you know, in this book, The Organization of Behavior, that, that we should start thinking about relation between brain and behavior. There was lo lots of very, very good cognitive behavioral science going on, and there was lots of, of good neurosurgery physiology going on, but he thought it was time to try to put the two together. And so he'd been writing this book, and, he, and when he was recruited to McGill, he had this book in manuscript, and he had a seminar. Unfortunately, the seminars in those days were in the evenings, so although I was teaching in the day on the other side of town, I could come down in the evenings, and that was a, a wonderful seminar. Mort Mishkin, that's where I met Mort, friend for life, but he was uh, uh, taking that same seminar with her, but we, not, people who took that seminar will never forget it, and we took the chapter by chapter, and we had to do all the background reading. Some of it was very tough neurophysiology, for us and so on. As, as I always point out, my background is not biology, it's maths and physics, my scientific way into psychology. So uh, the bio, the, you know, my, biologically, I was a little naive. And so, uh, but it, it was, was wonderful. And so in the meantime, the, the, uh, the, what, what about Peter and what about new, the imaging in, in Montreal, the, what we'd come over for? This, the atomic energy research had actually, by curiosity, begun in one wing of the University of Montreal. But after a year, the whole th thing moved to Chalk River. As you probably know, Chalk River in, in Ontario is still the place where uh, the sort of headquarters of, of Canadian atomic energy is much diminished now. And so Peter was there, I went there in the summer, and I was writing him long letters about Heb. I went to all this, this incredible seminar and I'd write Peter these long letters. And so Peter uh, gave up the, the, by this time it wasn't obligatory that he stay, the war was over. He um, gave up, uh, 
uh, engineering and physics and so on, came to Montreal, uh, applied to do with, uh, psychology with Hebb, worked his way through graduate school by helping to build the McGill cyclotron. And, and uh, uh, so he, he came, and, and he's a professor emeritus now in psychology. He worked on motivation and An excellent and, husband, indeed. Yes. An excellent You approve of him. I yes. think so, yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> So I think now we really must talk about HM and how you came <laughs> to work with HM uh, and what kind and of how I came to work with Penfield, right? That's, yeah, yes. well, Penfield and then with HM. Well, I, I decided I had to do a PhD uh, with, uh, and I wanted to do one with Heb. And you know, Heb was a very blunt person, very honest, very kind, really. But very, he had a his bark was definitely worse than his bite, but he had a big bark, and so he uh, he. Uh, uh, I, I persuaded him to take me as a graduate student, and I started actually doing some work on, on uh, ta tactile form perception in the congenitally blind. I was really quite enthusiastic about this, um, uh, but it hardly got off the ground before he called me in. And, and uh, one of the things, when Hebb came to McGill, he got a promise from Dr. Penfield that he could send one graduate student to go and study Penfield's patients at the Neurological Institute. And he asked me, I, uh, that's a bit of luck too. He said, would I like to do this? And this was in the summer of 1950. And I said, yes, I was sort of interested. And it was to study um, temporal lobe function really because uh, Penfield was, was operating on other parts of the cortex, but there is a very stubborn form of epilepsy temporal uh, involving the temporal lobe and it typically involves the medial structures of the temporal lobe, but we didn't realize that then. And so uh, now these operations are done to this day, are always in, in one hemisphere, you know? You can operate on one side, uh, one temporal lobe, if you've got the other one working properly. <laughs> it's, you can manage with one eye or one ear, but you know, as long as you've got one, one left, you're all right. And so all the surgery in Montreal has always been unilateral in one hemisphere. Uh, but w w what can we find out about the functions of temporal lobes? And although it would take too long for today, I've been... I've passionately kept up always with the, the work in the monkeys, and I got my, all my clues, you know, as to what might be worth investigating in people from work with monkeys where you could do bilateral removals, and so you could get a clue as to what the temporal lobes were really about, and you start from some, some big experiments like Huber and Busey, and you narrow it down, and Mort Mishkin was working on the inferior temporal cortex of the monkey, and we were communicating back and forth about degeneration in the pole, and all this sort of thing. This was, I was still interested in I was interested in the visual pathway from area 17 forwards. Uh, it was still not, not memory that was grabbing me. And so I, um, well, I, my thesis was on left temporals versus right temporals, and I, I was, it, you know, it was not too surprising that find left temporal low, you know, deficits, but the rights you always had to fight for, it's another story. But anyway, this, um, which way do you want me to go? Because I, I, if you want me to go into <laughs> bilateral... I'd like you to talk about HM. Because yes, all right. Well, both, HM is... A, is both a, as a research subject and as a human being that he was, well, because I, you knew him. I have okay. to make one thing okay. very, very clear. It's only right and fair to Penfield for one thing. Um, is that, you know, nobody seems to ask, why was this young uh, Canadian woman invited down to Hartford, Connecticut by a, a surgeon to study his patients. Nobody seems to think about that. They think either that HM was a Montreal patient, and he certainly wasn't, and we would never have done bilateral lesions in Montreal. Uh, but, uh, so, so why was I down there? And the reason for this is that uh, the, the operation of of left temporal lobectomy or right temporal lobectomy to cure epilepsy, uh, more and more came to involve removal, not just of the overlying neocortex, anterior to speak, but also of the medial structures, the amygdala and the hippocampus and overlying, uh, you know, the entorhinal cortex, the surrounding tissue. And I would like here to point out that in everything that Penfield and I have written and Scoville and I have written, we've always talked about the hippocampal zone, the hippocampal region. We have never said it was just the hippocampus, nor claimed that it was, but that we uh, knew that the hippocampus was involved in this, but not that it was solely the hippocampus. And also get a bit of historic sense, and this is hard nowadays, to really 
realize that when we were starting work in Montreal in those days in the 50s, we had no way of looking into the brain before the surgery. We knew the plain films of the skull, and we knew the shape of the ventricles. EEG was in its beginnings with Dr. Jasper, and we had just a few clues, and we were trying to find where the patient's seizures were coming from in order to operate and remove that area of, of damaged malfunctioning cortex. So it was important to get the side right and the locus right, and it was a lot of, uh, you know, it got to be pretty good at this, but it, it was very different from now when you have uh, MR and you have wonderful recording methods and so on and so forth. Totally different situation. Anyway, so we had, and, and I know that I have to get to HM, so I won't take too time, much time this. We had a very interesting patient in Montreal called PB, who was a, an engineer from New Jersey who had come and he'd had a very limited removal five years before. I hadn't known him then, just limited to the cortex because Penfield was very cautious. But he came back still having seizures, and Penfield realized he'd have to go medially. So he completed what had then become sort of standard temporal removal, removing the, the amygdala and hippocampus. And after that, this patient said, what have you people done to my memory? And now I had tested this man before the operation. I didn't test HM before his operation. I had tested him thoroughly. He didn't remember me, of course, but I had tested him. And I tested him after and I followed and showed all these essential features. And this was a, a highly intelligent man with a wife and family and a life and all the rest of it. And you could see, and head of his engineering office, and you could see what this had done. But you could also see that there's no change in his IQ, and this is a general thing which was superior, no change in his immediate memory as measured by digit span, his arithmetic, and so on. Uh, but just this forgetting his life as he lived it, which is a disaster. So we had two patients like that, and we decided we had to report them. And Penfield and I reported these at the annual, in Chicago, actually, at the end, my first visit to Chicago, the annual meeting of the American Neurological Association. And I present, presented these two cases. And we hypothesized that there was, in, to account for this unexpected memory loss, that there was atrophy, there was damage in the hippocampal region of the opposite hemisphere, the unoperated side, so that when Penfield made a removal on the left, effectively, he did, deprived the patient of hippocampal function bilaterally. That was our hypothesis. Twelve years later, PB died, and Dr. Penfield examined the brain and confirmed the hypothesis. There was more atrophy on the right than the removal on the left. But at the time, it was conjecture. And Dr. William Scoville, and I'm getting great jam, Dr. William Scoville, <laughs> the, uh, um, a surgeon uh, associated with Yale University working in Hartford, uh, was a read the abstract, and he came to the meeting, and he phoned Dr. Penfield, and he said, I think I have seen the sort of memory disturbance that you and Dr. Milner are describing in one of my patients uh, on whom I have done my operation. He just called it my operation at that point. And I would like to invite Dr. Milner to come down to Hartford and to test my patient and any other of my patients that interest her. And Penfield said to me, uh, would you like to go? And I said, yeah, you bet I'd like to go. <laughs> and, and so uh, this, this was what, what began my, why I got to see HM rather than somebody local from Yale. And I, I started taking the night train from McGill, uh, from Montreal, that's how you went to Hartford, arriving about three in the morning, uh, and uh, spending two or three days there working with the patient. And, and I would, uh, later I would take down a few tests from the McGill Psychology Department, what I could carry, and so on, and then come back and digest the results. Now, uh, where do you want me to go from there? That, that's how I met HM. Right. Uh, now, what yep. do you want to know? Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're asking me questions. What would you say is the most important research we've learned from HM? And I would like you to talk a little about him. About him. About him. Yes, well, uh, HM uh, died a couple of years ago at the age of 82. He was 27 when he was operated on, and he was 29 when I met him first. Uh, but the, in later years, he's been followed more by my former student, Suzanne Corkin, who's at MIT, uh, than, than by me. But for the, the beginning, it was just me. Uh, he was, he's a very, very gentle person. Um, he was very, it almost seemed uh, very gentle and passive, but when we suggested that might be to do with the amygdala removal, Dr. Scoville said, wait till you see his father. And the father was, was also gentle and passive. The mother was the, the, you know, the prime mover in that little family. 
uh, he'd had a terrible epilepsy. Uh, he'd had a, we still, this is something that from the, the pathology they may get clues to. We, nobody knows why he had such a terrible epilepsy. He had a minor accident, fell off his bicycle or something, and minor head injuries at, at the age of 16. And I think it was 16 or 9, I'm not sure. And then he developed these uh, terrible major minor seizures. Now, the operation that Scoville had developed, he developed in the bad old days of lobotomies and things for, for schizophrenia. And he had really, and it was a bilateral procedure, so it differed from any Montreal procedures. It was bilateral. They went in like that, uh, and it took the medial structures of both hemispheres. You'd expect to have trouble, I think, with them. Just, but, and he did it, uh, and not in an impulse, he discussed this with the family quite a bit before doing this. And he was influenced, I think, a great deal by the good results in the treatment of epilepsy, temporal lobe epilepsy we were having in Montreal. But PB, but HM's epilepsy was, was generalized, these huge seizures, was not presenting electrographically or behaviorally like temporal lobe seizures. But Scoville's a sort of gut reaction instinct about this was right because uh, from taking these huge doses of medication he became somebody he still had the occasional big seizure and quite a few little ones but he was on you know really really reduced doses of medication for the rest of his life it was a, a ma an amazing you know the good the good result from the point of view of epilepsy but of course with this terrible uh, memory impairment now, H.M. never knew me to the end of his life. I mean, he, he, I could be working with him and he would, uh, uh, you know, he was always polite. He knew in some way that he was doing something for science. Uh, he acquired little bits of semantic knowledge very slowly, you know, the cortical learning very slowly. I mean, it took him about five years to learn the layout of his new house that they had moved to in the, the just uh, shortly before his surgery. But he did learn it in, uh, over about a five-year period. He acquired, he knew there had been somebody, some president that had been killed, you know. He, he knew something about astronauts. He watched television assiduously, and he did crossword puzzles over and, and so on. But he had uh, these few facts that were of great interest in the world around him were presented on, on TV. TV and radio and conversation all the time. He acquired uh, slowly these little items. He didn't quite, he was very vague about them and a bit worried, but he did acquire these little bits of, of knowledge. And otherwise, you know, he was just forgetting from moment to moment. Uh, we got later in, uh, on when, when, uh, when Professor Toiber and I used to go and pick him up from Hartford and take him back to, to MIT and work with him for a bit. And when Professor Toiber died, uh, suddenly uh, Sue Cork and my students sort of inherited this. And, uh, and they would they have a little a hospital sponsored by NIH there at MIT, and they have they bring in people for nutrition studies, and then they bring HM in for a week. And I would be told HM's coming. Do, do any of your students want to see him or do anything? But it was really Sue then that was making uh, HM available to people. But in the early days, the most exciting thing for me, there is no question about this. I uh, to this day, I suppose it's the most exciting thing. It's trite now, of course. Um, when I started working with him, well, first of all, um, the, it was clear that he would retain information very, very well by constant verbal rehearsal. So the first day I would said to him, I want you to remember the number 584, and, he, uh, and I'm going out for a while, I'll come back. And I went out and, uh, for 20 minutes, and I had a cup of coffee with Dr. Scoville's secretary, and I came back, and I said, uh, what was the number? And he said, 584. And I was very naive back in those days, and I said, really? That's very good. How did you do it? He said, well, 5, 8, and 4 add up to 17. Divide by 2, you get 8 and 9. Remember 8. Divide 9, you have 5 and 4. 5, 8, 4. Simple, he said. <laughs> and, I said and I said, and do you remember my name? I'm sorry, the trouble is my memory. And so, so he'd forgotten that I told him over and over again. So here was this patient that we were saying, and that the other patients too, that they'd had a very restricted kind of part of the brain removed. And they were showing this forgetfulness of their life as they lived it. And this met with quite a lot of, you know, humming and hawing. There must be something sort of strange about this patient or about something. Thing. And, and you can't just, and you, you wanted to say, I certainly couldn't get up and say, 
he can't learn anything because people would say, well, have you tried to teach him anything? So the challenge then was to see you know, if, I, if there was some kind of learning he could do. And so that was, as I say, when I took these tasks from McGill and went down and trained him and, on all sorts of maze learning, and he couldn't learn them. And then, but I had, there was, was one exception, which was very exciting to me then, was a mirror drawing task. You probably all know what that is. But it was a five-pointed star, dub, double contour on an eight by 10 piece of paper. And, uh, but, and uh, he was told to start at the point as of the, and trace a, a line with a pencil, keeping within the narrow margins of the star. But the only thing that made this difficult was that uh, he could only see his hand and the star as reflected in a mirror. And you know what happens then you, when you get to the points. For all of us, you do this kind of thing because the mirror is giving you such misleading cues. But then as you go on practicing, uh, this improves and you eventually have a nice learning thing. And HM, I watched HM over uh, three days of a good nice graph of this, three days of, of the 30 trials and his errors and his time, and it came, beautiful learning curve. And then the next day, of course, he didn't know me or know us or anything, but he started where he left off, a bit jagged. The third day, this beautiful performance. And at the end of the last trial, and this was, again, one of these moving, you know, you remember a few emotional experiences. I, I mean, I do. You stand up, and he stood up, he was a tall man, and he looked down, and he said, that's strange, he said. The beginning, he said, I thought that was going to be difficult, but it seems as though I'd done quite well. He made no errors. He had just no recollection of all the experience of those trials he had lived through. And I was really excited, and I thought, oh, well, you know, psychologists have often said that motor learning is different. There are all sorts of rules about motor learning, which are a little bit different from other kinds of learning. I don't need to rehearse them to you. And maybe this is a different kind of system. Maybe there's another kind of learning. And as you know, there were other examples came up, and, and uh, it was what Larry Squire began calling procedural learning, and it involves very much the basal ganglia. And at the same time, my colleagues in England, everybody by this time, before they hadn't been interested in memory, but uh, now they were suddenly very interested in memory, and everybody wanted their amnesics. And my colleagues in England were working with, with uh, the people who had uh, survived <coughs> meningitis and were uh, uh, left with a, a memory condition like this because it had, it's, it had gone in and attacked those structures of the brain. And they uh, got a paper in, in Nature. I remember this Nature. Yes, it would be Nature. They're British. And the, uh, it was uh, uh, Larry Weisskrantz and Elizabeth Warrington at National Hospital. And it's what uh, we would now ca I call perceptual learning, but it's what people would call priming. They had shown that you know, if you're shown a puzzle picture, you, if I were to show you a puzzle picture, you didn't quite know what, what it was. And if I added a little bit more contour at a certain moment, you would say, oh, that's a dog, or oh, you know, that, that's a, a chair. Uh, then if I were to show you that the next day, of course, you would be able to recognize it with less cueing, you require less cueing. And then months later, Months later, and that's the learning memory aspect of it, months later, you would need less information. You would see, see these things. And HM, well, Larry Weisskrantz and Elizabeth showed for their patients that this was intact in amnesia. And I replicated this for HM months later. So that is an example of priming, and that depends very much on the visual cortex and so on, conditioning and things involving the cerebellum. So we have, starting with Lashley, let, let's finish with this, uh, this question. Starting with Lashley, we had this idea of, uh, the cortex being, you know, equipotentiality was just the ma and mass action. The more cortex you had, the better, and the more you lost, the worse. And so memory wasn't a very interesting topic to study if it was just that sort of quantitative thing in the, in the rats, in mazes. And then you get to the state when, when we're getting more and more discrete memory systems doing different kinds of learning, a totally different vision of, of the brain, and not just limited to the cortex by any means. And, but in the middle of it, you know, you have this still this key autobiographical memory, and we really are that kind of memory. We build our lives, our personalities, everything, on being able to build up from moment to moment and, and keep precious occasions in mind, like I would keep today. <laughs> We only have a few more minutes, and so I'd like to turn this to a kind of concluding thought. Here you are at 93, about to be 94, looking back over a life in psychological science. So I have a two-part question. To what do you attribute the excellence of your mind and memory, 
And what thoughts do you have for the next generation of psychological scientists coming up? Care to comment? Well, the first one, I think, easily. I, I really do attribute it to, to good luck in my genes. And, and one of the things that I got was a sort of a drive to excel, I suppose, to do what I wanted to do and not to be deterred. And so I was able to carve my way, and I had lots of good fortune, as I've told you, and wonderful teachers uh, and wonderful help. But I think that, really, I was very resolute. <laughs> That's the answer to that. Good genes and, res and being resolute was part of it. Uh, as far as the advice to coming people embarking in this wonderful field of, of the neurosciences and behavioral sciences. Um, I would like to say, first of all, if you've embarked on something and you find that it's not quite right for you, for goodness sake, don't hesitate to change. I could be a mediocre math teacher today and poor high school students, well, not today at 90, but poor high school, <laughs> <laughs> and that would have been no life for me or for the students, right? So if you're in the wrong track, change. But if you really are very attracted by uh, well, I would say by, I can't resist saying the neurosciences, but behavioral sciences, all this. Uh, life in the lab. Uh, don't think you're going to make a discovery every week or even every year. Um, you, you have to examine your own personality. Are you capable of being really very patient? I've never been bored. I, well, hardly ever. And so can you take a lot of readings, uh, you know, and just record things and, or, or, you know, spend a lot of time, maybe alone, in, uh, for a reward that may come months later, you know? It's, if that doesn't appeal to you, well, keep out of the science. It's glamorous, but it's got, you hear about the glamour and you don't hear about the frustrations or experiments that go wrong and you have to change your hypothesis and start all over. And there are grants that you don't get and there are all sorts of articles that don't get published. You know, if you can tolerate frustration, not get bored easily and get really excited by what you're doing, then you're in the right field. That, uh, that would be a good lesson for us all, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you have any further thoughts or comments you would like to offer to, to your listeners? Oh, I have my Advice list. for successful 90s. <laughs> well, no, I just, oh, about the successful 90s, I don't know, but about life in general, I, I do have my plug for bilingualism, multilingualism. I'm so grateful here to my parents that I was exposed to a foreign, a foreign language, which happened to be German very early. I really find that... Uh, it, it's very good for the brain. It helps you. I'm switching languages in Montreal all the time. It's good for the brain. Uh, it's been shown that you know, th th there's a benefit. Maybe a tiny loss in your own vocabulary in your own language, but it's worth it for, the, for, the, for this. Uh, but it's also tremendously rewarding socially. Travel if you can. That's my advice. And when you travel, you know, if you have, if you, whatever country, if you can begin to express yourself a little in that language, uh, you will have so much more welcome, so much more feeling of belonging. I mean, I've been privileged being in French Canada, it's a peculiar situation, but unusual situation, but it's really very, very enriching. So, so and if you're having children, please expose them to another language, it doesn't matter which one, very quickly, very quickly, and, and you won't regret it. It teaches you a lot about your own language. Sometimes when you hear how something is said in another language, you say, oh, yes, of course and it enriches your understanding of your own language also. So I really, and Dr. Penfield believed this. is one thing we really agreed about. He's, when he retired, he spent a lot of time going across Canada lecturing in favor of early learning of a foreign language, and I believe it. Dr. Milner, merci bien. Ah. Muchas gracias. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've come to the end of a yes. most interesting interview. Well, thank, you thank, so you thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you so much.